the Spirit of God is with you and also with you. Welcome to this virtual gathering of Washington Avenue Christian Church. My name is Nathan Russell. My pronoun preferences are he, him, and his. And I serve this congregation as its senior pastor. Thank you for inviting us into your viewing locations for the alternative and online virtual gathering to reconnect with God and with one another. You are welcome and wanted here and wherever you may be. And however you are, this is the alternative. This gathering is also an alternative to the myriad things that grab our attention and time. We pause from the streaming services and endless scrolling of social media and inhabit another time, call it alternative time. Come to think of it, worship itself is an alternative, an alternative to everything we have accomplished and have yet to complete, an alternative to decisions and demands, to muchness and manyness, to business and busyness. In a world of constant social distancing and separation, we come together to reconnect, rejoin, and remember. Together we will sing, we will hear, we will pray, we will share, and we will commune. Our pianist, Evan Collins, will lead us in the hymns, and the lyrics will appear on your screen. If singing is not your thing, perhaps more meaningful for you will be to create art, paint a picture, knit, or crochet. Or maybe internal silence will be most meaningful because you're feeling as parched as a dry sponge and you want to absorb and soak up as much as possible. That's okay and holy too. We hope you will connect with God in new ways, alternative ways, ways that are life-giving, loving, and liberating. The candles are lit, and we ring this bell to clear the air because our worship of God is about to begin. As we prepare to lift our hearts, will you join me in a query a query is an ancient practice of asking a question. You can engage this question by yourself or with a viewing partner in the live chat that's off to the side or with me on Twitter using our church's handle at W-A-C-C-E-L-Y-R-I-A. And the question is this, how are you further along now than you were last week?
a reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4b through 14. Listen for the word of God astir in these words of Scripture. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, oh, I have so much more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet, Whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through the faith of Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. So I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So, beloved, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. For the promise and covenant of the very best, most beautiful gospel good news, we say together, Thanks be to God. I know it was a long time ago, but one, one year ago on Monday nights, we, the people of Washington Avenue Christian Church, gathered at the Foundry Bar and Grill from 5.30 to 7 o'clock for Bible, burger, and beer. That is the theolo theologically correct order. Bible first, nutrient second, and wash it all down with Great Lakes Dortmunder. The six-week series was, was great. I mean, I mean, nothing will make you stand out quite so much as gathering 35-plus Christians into a gastro pub with a preacher who asked the gathered congregation to holler out, circumcision at such a volume that other foundry patrons lose their appetites. So how's that, you know, for evangelism and making a plain declaration and a public demonstration of the very best, most beautiful gospel good news. If we were to flash back to Galatians, a candidate for the earliest book in all of the New Testament, we'd know that a group of antagonizers infiltrated the church and started preaching another gospel, a Jesus plus gospel, which for the record is not the very best, most beautiful gospel good news. Far from it, in fact. This so-called gospel was Jesus plus circumcision. Jesus wasn't enough. Additional steps, more specifically a cut, were required. For the church in Philippi, we're not exactly sure what the different gospel was, other than it had to have been Jesus plus something. Jesus plus Moses. Jesus plus the law. Jesus plus angels. Jesus plus circumcision. Take your pick. We see this dreadful theology still at work in the church today. For example, some churches believe Jesus plus speaking in tongues makes you a better Christian, or Jesus plus a call to vocational ministry means you're holier than most 
And then there's that Jesus plus celibacy one. Anyone for that one? Uh, Come to think of it, that one sounds more like Jesus minus something. Paul, were he here, would be fit to be tied. A Jesus plus anything gospel always dilled poor Paul's pickle. Beware of those who preach the Jesus plus gospel, Paul warns the Philippians just before our reading began. He'd previously given them this warning, and it's likely the church in Philippi had heard about the gospel plus controversy in Galatia. Paul concluded, however, that the Philippians needed a reminder because zealots of the Jesus plus gospel were convincing in their attempt to make their own experiences the norm for those they sought to lead. The zealots still do that, even now, especially when they lead large rallies in capital cities in the name of Jesus, while not adhering to measures of safety protocols to mitigate a viral global pandemic. Before Paul's conversion, you know, there on that Damascus road, before he met Jesus, Paul had all of the pluses of that strange gospel. I mean, just listen to what Paul says. I was circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee with a capital P-H and then a D somewhere else, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church finer than any attorney general ever appointed, as to righteousness under the law, blameless, every letter, every jot, every tittle, I followed the law to a fault, blameless was I, Paul says. Now, Paul could toot his horn better than anybody, but arrogance and resume boasting is not Paul's goal here. Instead, he's beating the antagonizers, those who posit the Jesus plus gospel at their own game. Paul has every plus mark any human could hope to achieve or gain, or win. A Jesus plus gospel makes me fit to be tied too. With Paul, I can say and preach that it's Christ alone, by grace alone, through the gift of faith alone. But I have to tell you, church, and I'm just now starting to realize this, thank you, therapy, thank you, therapist, that I bought into a Jesus plus gospel. Oh, to be sure, I can list off the pluses just like Paul did. Though I was not born to any tribe of the house of Israel, I was born two minutes into Easter Sunday, 1980. Jesus came out of the tomb. I came out of the womb. Sounds fine. We're not going to discuss circumcision or following every aspect of the law, but I'm well-educated, seminary degree, with a concentration in biblical studies, preaching awards, ordained. Those are some pluses, I think. And I'm not trying to boast or be arrogant or brag on a resume, but all of these things (laughs) indicate the Jesus plus gospel by which I've lived my life. The Jesus plus gospel that I have bought into, hook, line, and sinker, is Jesus plus success, which is not some cheesy prosperity gospel. Rather, this gospel is Jesus plus personal achievement, Jesus plus personal effort, Jesus plus personal success. That mantra has been the gospel by which I have governed my life. It's why I entered a PhD program, though I really did love it and miss it and would, would like to continue it someday. 
It's also why I want to be at the top of my game. It's why I want to be the best. I cling to success like Charlton Heston did his rifle. I could say of my success, I'll give it to you when you take it from my cold, dead hands. This gospel, it's, it's tricky because it asks for your best and it can produce a beautiful product that sounds really good too, but it's not the very best, most beautiful gospel good news. After some reflection, I'm not sure exactly who taught me the Jesus plus success gospel. All I can say that it happened across many years in different cities and in different churches and denominations. Church leaders were convincing in their attempt to make their own experiences the norm for those they sought to lead. And as a result... I pressed on toward success, pressed on toward bigger and better, pressed on toward achievement and gain. The most incendiary part of this Jesus plus gospel was that I thought it would make me more lovable, more acceptable to God, to the church, and to my family. I also thought the success might make me more acceptable to myself. And here's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. I thought that if I achieved enough success and was in a church and doing great things, my family and those who do not accept me could look at and focus on the success so they did not have to look at that one part of me that they find objectionable, questionable, and unacceptable. Saying that out loud is really scary because we're at the limit, the threshold of my authenticity and vulnerability. And I'm not sure how what I just said will be heard by a church that I dearly and truly love. Paul, who is writing to the Philippians from jail, hardly a palace of success, said to the Philippians, whatever gains I had, whatever pluses I amassed, whatever achievement, success, you name it, all of these, I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For Christ's sake, I have thrown away everything and I regard it all as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found by God in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law or success or achievement or plus this or that, but righteousness that comes through the gift of love, the gift of the faith of Jesus Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Paul went from preaching to meddling with that paragraph, and I'm not sure exactly that I appreciate it. And yet, I hear something in his words that sounds like gospel, pure gospel, no plus or minus, just the very best, most beautiful gospel good news. Paul has to repeat himself several times in that paragraph. I'm letting all that stuff go, he says, not once, not twice, three times. None of these pluses 
was taken away from him by someone. No, no, no. No one forced Paul to give up his pedigree or his credentials. Far from it. Through the gift of faith, Paul decided that Jesus was enough. Paul wanted to know Christ and the power of Jesus' resurrection and the sharing of Jesus' sufferings by becoming like Jesus in his death so that somehow, wondrously how, Paul did not know, but that he too might attain the resurrection from the dead. When I got home last night from church, I I talked with Chad and was kind of mulling over these thoughts. And I said to him, I think I want to quit pressing on toward all the things that I've said are important. The things that have really mattered to me. I just don't know that the pluses and achievements and successes are all that important. It's exhausting trying to do it all. And the pursuit of all this not to be overly dramatic. I feel that it could kill me. Chad looked at me strangely, waited, paused for a moment, and said, Are you sure? These are all the things that have been important to you since I've known you. Giving up on the pursuit of success and all the pluses does feel like a magnificent defeat and a failure, which is, well, failure is what I fear more than anything on earth. But Paul had this idea that if he gave it all up, if he let that rubbish go, he might practice resurrection and live life anew. He might press on towards something, something eternal, something beyond, something that moth nor rust can destroy, something that thieves cannot break in and steal. In his letter, Paul gives the Philippians a personal testimony He shares his story in order to have an impact not on individuals, but on the whole church. I'm trying to do the same. To give you a personal story that will have an impact on the whole church. So what would happen, do you think, if we, as the church, let go of all the things by which we've defined success. Membership, butts in pews, budgets, building, and an annual report to the Disciples Yearbook, just to name a few. What would happen if we counted all of that stuff as rubbish, Believe me, I know it is hard and close to heresy because these measurements, these pluses, have always determined personal and ecclesial success. To no longer play by these rules, to no longer measure ourselves by this gospel plus, Well, it may feel like death to us. But Paul, he had this idea that if the church gave it all up, if they let that rubbish go, they might practice resurrection and live life anew. The church might press on towards something, something eternal, something beyond, something that moth nor rust can destroy, and something that... Thieves cannot break in and steal. I got to tell you, church, that invitation, it fires my jets. 
It's exciting, energizing, invigorating, and risky and scary as you can imagine all at the same time. Before, though, we get too carried away, Paul does say, oh, don't you dare think that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal? Ha! Far from it. That'll never happen. We, you and I, we may never arrive, but arrival is not the point. More important is to be on the way, to press on, to make this gospel, this way of life, our own, because Christ Jesus first has made the church his own. And nothing we can do, no success, no number of pluses, will change that. None of it will make us, as Christ's church, more lovable. Christ has already made us his own. We didn't make ourselves Christ's own. No, no. Jesus did that first. But, but there is something we can do. We should do. I think we must do. Let go of our measurements of success from yesteryear and press on toward what lies ahead. Together with God's help, we will let go and press on toward the goal, toward the very best, most beautiful gospel good news, and the ultimate prize that awaits when the reign of God has come up on earth as it already is in heaven. It'll be the day that God gets everything, everything that God wants. Amen. As we come to this time of prayer, I invite you to visit the link below in the video description that opens up our our web portal uh, to submit your joys and concerns to this church body. It is our great privilege and joy to accompany you in prayer, to speak your name and the name of your beloveds to the very heart of God. We take this calling seriously. And remember, remember, beloved, that we make the reign of God come ever near. 
when we pray with and for one another. So, as we begin this prayer of the people, uh, this is an alternative prayer. It's different than the ways in which we normally pray. This prayer is not passive, but active. It's a body prayer, one that will engage our full selves, and I invite you to participate in ways that are helpful and meaningful for you. So church, I invite you to stretch out your arms and hands in front of you as far as they can go, and let us pray. Oh God, we are a people who press on and on and on and on. Pressing on is what our world has taught us to do. To just, keep do, do. to just keep going. To do more with less. To strive towards success with all our might. We've bought in to the myth of success as individuals and as a church. So we ask you, will you liberate us, rescue us, and save us from this rat race that we're in. Stepping out of everything we've thought was uber important is difficult, and we're going to need your help every step of the way. Remind us again and again that when we step out of something, we can step into something, something New, something eternal, something beyond, something that moth moth nor rust can destroy, that no one can steal or take. It sounds like grace. God, in case you haven't noticed, but we think you have, 2020 has been a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad year. We couldn't give 2020 a single star online review. Our comment would be, we don't recommend it, avoid it at all costs. We are discouraged, exhausted, and disappointed. And anyone who tells us to press on right now, we might hurt them truly because we're just trying to hold on and hang on for dear life. And if we just, if we let go of all that we've held near and dear, that just sounds like giving up or even like death. Now, church, I invite you to reach upward, stretch out your arms and hands as far as you can go. And yet you, O God, in ways we cannot understand, promise resurrection and life anew. We can stop chasing the successes by which we've defined ourselves in our church. We can let go and press on toward something new. You actually tell us that this yoke of yours, this calling, that it is easy and its burden is light. And that sounds really, really good right now. So here's the thing, God, and we're, we're just being frank here. Everything we've said when our hands were out in front is still true. And yet we hear your invitation to join you on a journey of pressing on toward the future you want and ultimately will have. This means our priorities will have to shift. And let us tell you, <laughs> old habits, mm, they die hard. But resurrection can only come after a death. New life can only come when we've let go. A new chapter can begin when we put a period and turn the page and see an open expanse of canvas and sky. Help us. (laughs) We need it. And remind us that we will always, always, always be found in you. Now, church, will you bring your hands toward your heart as in a posture of devotion as we pray together? 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the below video description, there is also a link that opens our online giving portal. We invite the gifts of your first fruits, your stewardship made known through your practice of discipleship, your tithes and offerings, your gifts and your talents. They sustain the ministries of this church as we participate in the mission of God. So I invite you, truly God invites you, to give as you are able, to give as a sign of your thanks, to give generously in ways that will help us press on toward that very best, most beautiful gospel good news. And now we come to this table. It is always an invitation. And I think today, especially in the midst of everything we find going on in our world in this year, Jesus would say, come, take all the time you need, stay as long as you need, recline at the table. No one is in a hurry. But may the nourishment you find here, the bread and the wine with which you wash it down, May it give you the energy you need to press on. On the night Jesus met with his disciples in an upper room, he first washed his hands, and then looking upon the table, he found gifts of both grain and grape. And taking the bread, he broke it, and he said, This is my body broken for you. Take, eat, all of you, and do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks for it, he poured it out and said, This is the cup of the new covenant poured out in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, and do this in remembrance of me. For as long as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we let go. And we press on. Come, beloved, everything is ready. to the world, beloved, and make a plain declaration and a public demonstration of the very best, most beautiful gospel good news. Remember that you are never, ever very far from God's heart. Embody the gospel that is alternative to the ways of the world. Press on toward the reign of God on earth as it is in heaven. 
And finally, finally, trust with everything you've got that God will have the future God wants, and it's already, already here and on its way. Amen.